Hello everybody. I am Pratima Munkar. I am an Indian woman with curly black hair. Uh, I'm wearing a yellow, bright yellow jacket uh, with a black top and gold hoop earrings. I'm going to speak to you today about accessibility and how it is a responsibility and an opportunity. There are no limits to what we can all achieve if technology truly reflects the diversity of the people that it represents and the people that are actually using it. And, uh, you know, what we really need to remember and understand is that accessibility is critical as a, a driver of economies all across the world. So what I'm going to now speak for another 15 odd minutes is really about how we could all work together to make our world more inclusive. I lead cloud growth strategy um, for Microsoft APAC, and I'm also the accessibility lead as well as the diversity and inclusion council lead for APAC for Microsoft. So I'm really happy and thrilled to be part of this journey with you. What is accessibility? This is something that many people, when you know, I speak to customers, I speak to our partners, many people come back and ask us, what exactly does it mean to each of you? For some people, accessibility is all about uh, digital accessibility, or some people it is about workplace modifications to be able to allow people on wheelchairs to come in and go out of the office, etc. I would contend that accessibility is very simple. It's really about creating better experiences for everyone. It's about how we could use the technology that we have and how AI can then help make, uh, make solutions and make the world more accessible to anybody who wants to use it. So in the past where you know uh, we had to adapt to the world around us, AI can help make add that layer where it can make the world adapt to us. So accessibility puts the power of that uh, change in your hands, in everyone's hands. And uh, really, so therefore, accessibility is, is a gamut of uh, you know, work that we can do uh, for people with disabilities to help empower everybody uh, at work, at school, in daily life. And it covers all the types of disabilities that you see here. It could be vision, it could be hearing, it could be neurodiversity, it could be around mobility, uh, mental health, you know, the entire uh, gamut that you see here. Now, why do I say that accessibility is a responsibility and an opportunity? This is one statistic that always comes to me whenever I speak about accessibility to people. Did you know that there are 1 billion people in the world that have disabilities and nearly 650 million are in our APAC countries alone, in, in Asia alone? And did you know that only one in 10 have access to the products that are required to help make uh, the world accessible? Only one in 10 have access to assistive technology. Another important point that all of us need to keep aside is that only 70% of disabilities are really, you know, uh, are actually invisible to many of us. So you don't even know uh, what could be affecting people around us at any point of time. Disability can affect any of us at any time. It could be permanent, it could be temporary, it could be situational. Many of us in, in COVID times have faced situational disabilities also and the need for assistive tech when we are stuck at home, for example. It could be that, you know, um, for the past few days, I've been having a, a bit of an arm injury, let's say, or, or a, or a um, pain on my wrist. And again, I might need assistive tech. So it can hit any of us at any point of time. It could even hit our people that we you know, uh, love and care for our family at any point of time. So accessibility is definitely a responsibility. But more importantly, I'd like everybody who's listening to take away the key message that accessibility is also an opportunity. There are masses of data which show that companies that are inclusive, inclusive organizations outperform their peers. They attract the talent that they need. Millennials today, um, who are going to be 75% of the workforce very shortly, they choose companies, they choose employers who reflect their values and diversity and inclusion is top of the list for them. 
companies that are uh, organizations that are inclusive, post higher revenue, higher net income, and they have an overall higher performance. So folks, it makes a lot of sense for uh, all of us to seriously think about this and think about how we can make our companies accessible and inclusive. So it is with that aim and with that ambition that we launched the Microsoft APAC Enabler Program. We realize very well many things. One is that, uh, you know, first of all, it's critical that all of us get onto this journey because what is really important is all of us getting together and making the world a lot more inclusive. We realize that it's not something that only one company can do or, you know, um, uh, moving forward where technology, uh, you know, leveraging technology is concerned. Uh, is, is, is not just the owners of one company. We all need to get together. And as a group, we should work together to make a more inclusive um, and, and embrace uh, the inclusion that is required. So what is really important is to build a more inclusive world using the technology that we have, but also leverage on partnerships to be able to make the technology more, um, to, to scale it and to make it more ubiquitous across the world. So it is with that aim that we launched the Microsoft Enabler program. And let me now run a small video, which will tell you something more about the program. An inclusive culture is one that is not just about trying to integrate a group of people with disabilities, but rather it is a mindset that regardless of who you are or what you have, you would not feel different from others. And I'm very happy to say that Microsoft has leveled the playing field for me. My name is Raymond. My name is Adrian. And I am Retinitis Pigmentosa. Currently, I'm a final year student at NUS majoring in data science. I was approached by Microsoft to decide how I can support Siri, who was a deaf intern. At Microsoft, I was part of the PDM team or Partner Development Management Team. I primarily deal with projects centered around partners. Both of us are deaf, and we understand the common set of challenges that we face at work. So one of the areas that we face is how to communicate with your colleagues effectively. We identify a few options. What will be a speech to test subscription? The other way is to teach colleagues a simple standard language. SG Enable was very instrumental in helping me secure a role at Microsoft. My hiring manager, Pratima, who is also the chair for DNA Accessibility at Microsoft, has very graciously crafted projects for me. They are very tailored to my strengths. In this journey, it was quite challenging because I do not have any mentoring experience. So I feel that it helped me to be more uh, open-minded and more innovative and uh, understand that uh, everyone has their own different needs. Microsoft fully subsidizes in employees to take up Microsoft certified certifications. And I've been making full use of these perks at Microsoft to upgrade myself and learn essential skills, such as equipping myself with certifications in Microsoft Azure and Power Platform's fundamentals. These skills have helped me to develop a deeper understanding of not just Microsoft product, but also cloud technology, automated reports and apps in general. From working with partners, I've learned a lot about the different users of technology. Moving on from Microsoft, I intend to use the knowledge I've acquired from working at Microsoft to launch my own startup. This is about creating the right experiences for everyone, including our potential partners and clients, by making them feel respected it definitely helps to create a sense of belonging and inclusiveness. Everyone is always saying that they should start out of the comfort zone. Take your opportunity to step out of your zone and make your place more accessible and inclusive now. Now is never too late. And that gives you, I'm sure, a little bit of an idea of what the 
enabler program is all about. Let me just share a little more with the aim of um, helping you uh, think about it and maybe adapt and uh, you know create a similar program for yourselves. Um, we have learned a lot in this program, and uh, the aim of the sharing is just to trigger thought. Right? You know, and and uh, I don't claim to know it all, but I definitely do uh, have uh, some experience in this. So what this program really is all about is a consortium based approach where we have invited a nonprofit organization as well as our commercial partners to join us in this journey. So companies and participating partners provide opportunities for job experiences, shadowing, mentoring and internships. We have also um, supplemented the program with training for people with disabilities as well as accessibility uh, workshops for our participating partners. This also helps our participating partners um, in, you know, encourage and adopt as well as adapt to a more inclusive culture uh, by making their own uh, internal uh, culture a lot more inclusive of people with disabilities. So accessibility becomes top of the mind into the company strategy and how basically to go about that, you know, um, especially in tech organizations is what we uh, help and uh, consult and give, give inputs to the companies on this. Um, the nonprofit organizations work as the view of what, uh, you know, people with disabilities need, uh, what is the kind of training that they need and so on. So typically we look at cloud and AI training on this. Uh, and as I said, accessibility 101 training for our partners. Now, um, we launched this in uh, 2020 and um, I'm, you know, despite COVID, I think uh, we've, uh, achieved some amount of learning and uh, gone ahead on the three big pillars of this program, which is to increase awareness, to build talent and to enhance employability. We launched it at five countries and, you know, with a few partners, 16 partners. And our journey has now evolved through 2021, where we added some more partners. We added uh, um, uh, expanded to Sri Lanka, uh, onboarded some more uh, non-profit organizations. And then in 2022, we went ahead and uh, uh, as of now, expanded further into some more countries. Very excited that we are in more countries, including Indonesia, Malaysia. You see all the, all the flags here, as well as Nepal. Added some more NPOs and partners into this. And um, together, uh, with our partners as a consortium, as I said, we have uh, run more than 300 plus hours of uh, disability inclusive hiring workshops, uh, help train more than 77,000 hiring managers and senior leaders on accessibility and um, opened up more than 350 roles for uh, people with disabilities and projects and so on. 530 people have completed training and certification. So you see all the numbers here in front of you. Um, we are also this year, we have very recently, uh, just a few months ago, also launched uh, uh, the Microsoft Enabler Mentorship Program. And uh, this is really for early in career uh, 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 talent and uh, to help them actually um, grow both personally as well as professionally with career guidance and sponsors from, um, from the tech field as well as non-tech. So uh, it is opened up now, including, uh, you know, uh, for accounting or, um, or um, HR or uh, um, design jobs. But Typically, these will all be tech enabled. So why I'm sharing all this with you again is hope to... My name is Grover. Sean. My name is Ian. I'm Taylor. My name is Owen. And I'm nine and a half years old. So Owen was born with a rare genetic disorder called Escobar syndrome. He's had 33 surgeries to date. I love video games, my friends, my family, and again, video games. It's his way of interacting with his friends when he can't physically otherwise do it. What I like about the adaptive controller is now everyone can play. You can just say, all right, that's that button, that's that button, that's that button. Perfect. One of the biggest fears early on is, how will Owen be viewed by the other kids? 
<laughs> He's not different when he plays. No matter how your body is or how fast you are, you can play. It's a really good thing to have in this world. So folks, as we come to the end of this segment, what I'd really like to again reiterate to everybody here and ask you to take away as a few closing statements is, one, there are no limits to what people can achieve when technology actually reflects the diversity of all of us who use it. Second, please remember that building accessibility into everything that we do helps empower people of all abilities to achieve more and do what they actually love. All of you have a responsibility as well as an opportunity to create inclusive technology that works for all of us or help nurture this inclusive technology itself. So let's get together and uh, get uh, innovating and make our world more inclusive. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you, Pratima, for your um, insightful presentation. Since Pratima has another engagement, the following Q&A session will be responded by Mr. Rahul Goke. Mr. Goke? Hi, nice to Hi meet there. you. Uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rahul. Uh, I'm based in Singapore. I'm the accessibility co-lead for Microsoft uh, APAC. And uh, yeah, I'm here to you know answer any questions you might have. Uh, so feel feel free to to ask. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, we have some questions from the audience. Um, so first, uh, the MS Enabler program is an impactful initiative across country to support employment for people with disability. Are there only uh, are there only uh, big enterprises joining now? Uh, is there any business case for SMEs? Yes, great question. So we actually partner with a wide range of enterprises. So we have, you know, SMB, SMC uh, enterprise. We work with partners who are what we call GSIs or global system integrators. But we also work with very niche, smaller partners. So, uh, you know, if you're keen to partner with us, please reach out. Uh, there's no, no cap or no bar or no minimum criteria. So you know, we're more than happy to partner with us in, in this journey. That's great. That's great. And uh, I think, well, in the end, like business is still a very big partner in the society, despite of any political or uh, 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 situational pro uh, 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 problems or uh, status quo. Uh, business is still a big partner, no matter in, I, I guess, in Hong Kong or in any other countries uh, around the world. Exactly. Um, so that's why it, it, it's important to invite them to uh, be part of the program as well. Um, the other question is on the Accessibility 101 training to partners are to be attended by employers or people with disability. Um, so it's a, just a su suggestion here. Um, the, the training can extend to schools or universities, uh, par partners, so that to let more people to know about it early. Yeah, great, great question. Um, the training is actually open to everyone. So it is not only Microsoft partners, it is not only PWDs. So any lay person can go ahead and take the, the, the training. Uh, like even my, my parents have taken it, for example, and they have, <laughs> they have no, no connection to Microsoft uh, at all. So um, personally, I found the training really, really meaningful. I think I learned a lot that I didn't know earlier. It's not very Microsoft specific, it's more broad. And uh, I, I would encourage uh, you to, uh, you know, to, to take it up. Having said that, the content is, it might be a little advanced at the school level, especially like middle school level. I think if you're in, in uni, like in college, if you're in high school, uh, I think you can, you know, uh, grasp the content pretty easily. If it is more like primary school, middle school, uh, it might be a little complex. Um, I don't know if we have content for that age group, but I, I can I can find out. It's 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 a great point. 
Well, that would be uh, amazing because kids are using computers now. So I guess Microsoft definitely has a stance on it. <laughs> and um, there's one question on uh, could the certification paths training support different languages? We do offer a few at this time, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I need to check how many Asian languages we support because typically it starts with English and then it's usually Western European languages and then it uh, moves to, to Asia. I believe Chinese is supported, but I'll, 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 I can double check and send you a follow up after this. Uh, yeah, how you doing? That would be good. Um, uh... Oh, oh, um, this is also my curious as well is um, uh, when you adopt this training or you put it out to the uh, to to the people, uh, is do you find people are changing minds as well? Do you have you ever hear like changing mind story? Yeah, totally. I mean, I think in it's not just the 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 training. The training is one part of it, but I think the enabler program, the mentoring. I think all these uh, projects that we have embarked upon in the last few years, uh, we can see real world impact. Um, you heard some stories in the videos from interns we have hired, but you know, every every day, every week, we talk to people who've gone through these programs, uh, and you know, their lives have changed in a very tangible sort of a way. So, um, and this, this is just a sample of what we do, right? So we have. The, the training, we have the enabler program, but we also do other things like uh, we run hackathons for assistive technology. Uh, you know, we do a lot of customer programs as well, working with customers and their customers. And for all of these, we've seen some very tangible impact. So it's it's not just at a, you know, at a, at a conceptual level. I think we've seen some real world impact there, um, especially the enabler program. A lot of people have, you know, found internships, found jobs, uh, and this may not have been possible maybe some years ago. So I think we have seen the the, the dial shift uh, in this space for sure. I see. That's uh, amazing. And also, uh, one question on the All Kids Can Play program. We just uh, watched the video, and which is amazing seeing the kids very enjoying, despite of their uh, disability, they can play together. Um, this is, uh, an, uh, uh, our audience is actually curious on what would be the next step of this project. Yeah, great question. So we actually have a pretty large team in Microsoft focusing on just accessibility. So I think we are among the few companies in the world that has what we call a CAO, a Chief Accessibility Officer. Hmm. And under her, she has uh, people in you know who do program management, people who work with partners, and people in product as well. So we have PWDs in Microsoft who directly influence our products, right? So um, the even the the Xbox, the Xbox haptic controls, uh, we have a lot of internal feedback to continuously enhance the the Xbox product, and it, it's not just that. I mean we have. There's, there's a YouTube video I can share later, or you can Google it. Uh, there's a Seeing AI app that we've built, which is for persons who are blind to be able to gauge what's around them. And we are also making improvements to that. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, you know emphasis on this in the products. So you'll keep seeing enhancements, improvements to all of these products, whether it is people who are you know blind, people who are deaf, people who are in wheelchairs. So we try and target all all ranges of uh, PWDs, yeah. Great, and uh, I think that uh, no matter is uh, is about disability or in, even and other types of like inclusion, uh, like for example ethnic minorities. I think this is uh, it becoming uh, uh, more uh, uh, concerning issues all around the world, it, it, also in Hong Kong, and. Um, I think what uh, the the, the uh, presentation Pratima just gave actually uh, reflect to us that um, uh, it is important to include as much as possible as uh, people who are from diverse background. Actually, that helps us to uh, change our products or our services as well. Um, do you see that? Uh, or do you can you name one thing that actually uh, having this uh, diverse uh, workforce in Microsoft and 
what that what has they changed the product or the work of yours? Yeah, uh, great, great question. I mean, I think we do strongly believe that you know diversity is our strength, right? So we do try and uh, make sure that every project team, every product team, there's you know we we have enough I guess representation from all kinds of people. You know, I mean, whether it's PWDs, it's people of color, mm -hmm. whether it is someone who's you know uh, Asian, whether it's someone who's uh, who's black, who's white, who's, you know, there's a there's a range there because everyone has very different backgrounds and perspectives and, and so on. So uh, whether it's in the product team or the corp team in, in Seattle or whether it's in the region as well uh, in, in APAC, uh, we do try and make sure that you know we have diverse perspectives. I think we are all much richer. I think the, 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 uh, the perspective we get is much, much richer. Uh, when it comes from from very diverse uh, backgrounds. Yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Wahoo, for joining us today. And I wish you all the best and your team's efforts will be uh, more visible in the in, in, in days ahead. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you, bye-bye, take care. Bye. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Pitarma and I'm a project manager at the innovation department of Caritas Coimbra in Portugal. I'll divide my presentation into three different moments. First, I'll introduce to you Caritas Coimbra and the work of the Innovation Department. Second, I will explain what was the SmartWord project and its services. Third, the trial run at Caritas Coimbra results and lessons learned. Caritas Coimbra is a Portuguese social non-profit organization. We work into four intervention areas, social, health, education and pastoral, in five districts of the central region of Portugal. We have 90 centers, 126 social responses and about 1,000 employees who supports about 14,000 people a year. Our intervention areas are divided in six groups of social responses, older adults, health, youth and education, children and families at risk, danger, inclusion and other services. In the next slide, I'll present a movie that will explain in an interactive way the work that I and my colleagues from the Innovation Department develop. In 2014, Caritas Coimbra, a non-profit organization that operates in the central region of Portugal, was taking its first steps in the implementation of projects that stimulate active and healthy aging and the well-being of its older users. In addition to the adoption and provision of new technologies, Caritas Coimbra also wanted to increase health and technology literacy, stimulating conversation among its users, arousing curiosity, stimulating physical and cognitive exercise, combating isolation and loneliness, and bringing families closer together. We listened to their opinions from the very first moment and were adapting the systems to their needs. In recent years, we have continued this work, and during the pandemic we have been able to ensure that these people keep in touch with their families and centers, and even that they have something to entertain them. This was possible through the Dappers project. But we also experienced a project that allowed people that live alone, not to forget to take their medication and be encouraged to drink water. But we also don't forget our employees, and through the Smart Work project, we have improved the work environment of employees over 55 years. Through technologies that measure stress, assess air quality, and stimulate physical exercise contrary to sedentary lifestyle. Through co-design sessions with older users, caregivers and stakeholders we are attentive to the needs and opinions of all stakeholders in the innovation process. We are also responsible for the ethical tasks in the projects we implement, because we speak on behalf of our older users, and want to ensure that all their rights are secured as well as their privacy. This is our strategy for promoting health and well-being, throughout life. In Caritas Coimbra we are not inventors, but we innovate. We innovate with people, for people.
In Caritas Coimbra, we are not inventors, but we innovate. We innovate with people, for people. And in the Smart Work Project, we innovate with our colleagues with more than 55 years old. The project Smart Work started in January 2019 and finished 39 months later in March 2022. There were involved 10 partners, two were end users organization where the pilot run, Aurus Municipality and Caritas Coimbra. As an end user organization, I'll introduce this project from the perspective of Caritas Coimbra. What is Smart Work Project? The Smart Work Project builds a work-centric AI system for workability sustainability, which integrates an, an oxidative sensing and modeling of the worker state with a suite of novel services for context and worker-aware adaptive work support. Smart Work aims to design and create age-friendly living and working spaces. The objectives of Smart Work Project were to create a worker-centric artificial intelligence system for workability sustainability, to achieve an obstructive sensing and modeling of the worker state, to implement a novel Smart Work Services suite for the context and worker-aware adaptive work support. At the beginning of the project, three services were designed. Office worker services, employer services and carer services. During the project develop development with the implementation of the co-creation phase and the results of the pre-pilot, some parts of the main idea were restructured to better achieve the user's needs from Caritas Coimbra. To evaluate effectiveness, three action points were defined. KPIs, for example, increased self-confidence and desire to return to work of the employee after severe disease by 30%, instruments like validated questionnaires, focus group, personal interviews and system performances during different periods of time. Three action points were defined to evaluate the services. Assess usability of smart work services and products and system features among the major subgroups of target users, providing evidence of user-centered design and innovation, new intuitive ways of human-computer interaction and user acceptance. Assess the impact of smart work in supporting independent living and quality of life of older persons, compared to the current state of the art, enabling older persons to stay actively involved in work life for longer or return to work after severe disease. Assess the impact of smart work in promoting enhanced health and safety working conditions and quality of life of older persons at work compared to the current situation, enabling older persons to be able to contribute at an appropriate level for a longer period of time. Assess potential cost effectiveness due to enhanced self-care, lifestyle, age-friendly and skills, conductive work environments and socio-economic economic benefits. At Caritas Coimbra, the Smart Work Project has tested three different services, UbiWork, Healthy Me and Activity Coach, and finally, My Workability. And these three services were divided into areas. First, PC, laptop equipment and software, and second, Smart Work Applications. In the next slide, I'll explore deeply these services. The first step for each worker was to assess its user profile, profile from Smart Work Desktop. Initially, the user must fill in the questionnaires when the desktop application is installed. Some of these questionnaires uh, they were demographics, 
lifestyle, health condition, work, sleep, and workability. Based on the personal profile and logged the smart work AI machine will issue interventions to the user, either asking or updating last two questionnaires or interve intervene by giving advice and guidance to lower the risk of disease and conditions. All the data collected are used to building a virtual user profile for each user in order to timely intervene for the improvement of his or her workability. Important to notice that all other services are interconnected with the user profile. UbiWork aims to support on-the-fly work flexibility through a universal computer work environment. Smart work exploits the auto personalization infrastructure to build inclusive, accessible interfaces for the office workers, which adapt to their current needs and preferences and are pervasive between devices, operating systems, and technologies. At Caritas Coimbra, Morphic was installed in the workstations. This version was adapted to the specific needs and processes of the Caritas Coimbra workers. A lower bar appears with several shortcuts with the programs most used by the workers. It is important to note that each worker could adapt these shortcuts to his or her roles and needs. My workability Services aims at continuous assessment of the capacity of the office worker, the provision of flexible working practices and AI decision support to enhance their psycho-physical capacity by predicting short-cut and long-term changes in the capabilities and abilities of the office worker and translating such changes into the involving work requirements. The environmental sensor box is a sensing device designed to collect information on the environmental conditions in employees' office. Focus Buddy is a PC application that performs eye gaze tracking and active window tracking by use of a camera. It is used in the cognitive state estimation model of smart work for the training of machine learning models as a complement to other psychological and activity tracking data. The models are used for assessing when the user is focused on a computer task versus has been distracted when the user is mentally fatigued, momentarily stressed or mentally overloaded. Healthy Me service aims at the continuous, unobtrusive and ubiquitous monitoring of physi physiological and behavioural parameters of older adults for efficient self-management of chronic health conditions, positive change of behavioural attitudes and improved quality of life of the older worker. The smart mouse is a wireless mouse that is capable of an illustratively measures several health-related data from the user. It was mainly used by the office workers during their everyday interaction with desktop or laptop device. Several parameters provided by the mouse, such as a galvanic skin response, heart rate, temperature and trembling, are processed locally on the user's computer and combine it with other work-relevant data, like the mouse cursor position and mouse click keys in the order to infer the user's emotional status at each point in time. Both sensorial data and high-level estimations about the psychomotor states of the user, for example, arousal associated with stress, anxiety, fatigue, lack of confidence, among others, are sent to the smart work cloud servers. The iCare service is a web-based portal for efficient care management. 
It allows carers, family or friends to support the older office worker reaching their health goals by providing summaries of health-related information collected with the HealthyMe service after the user's consent. As a strong focus is placed on privacy and control, the office worker can configure with the HealthyMe service with data they want to share, from which period of time and with who. The first step to having access to the HealthyMe service is to connect the smart bands and the app Activity Coach that we use to call Amelia, the name of avatar that interacts with the worker. Amelia makes a questionnaire to the user to create with him or her a set of goals, which includes the number of steps or types of exercises during the week. Other metrics are measured also, such as nutrition, sleep, heart rate or weight. All the data collected could be analyzed by the worker at the mobile app or the smart work desktop. Or, as mentioned on the previous slide, it could be shared with the carer. Regarding the trial, it should be noticed that Caritas Coimbra has several social responses in the central area of Portugal. This covers all age groups, for example, nurseries, kindergartens, leisure activities for children and youth, reintegration centers, nursing homes, daycare centers, home support and others. Of all the employees that participate in the trial, 44% use a computer in their daily life, while 56% perform more practical and direct tasks to user. It is important to know that some of these 44% of employees who use the computer do not spend a complete workday in the office. They have other functions such as direct care or visits abroad, what have impacted the evaluation of the system. Different instruments were used to evaluate the effectiveness of the smart work services. Today, I'll just include some parts of the usability scale. We have evaluated the services in three different perspectives regarding the user experiences, mobile phone and their apps, PC and apps included, and the smart work complete system. Sue's evaluation of mobile phone applications 57% said that would like to use the system frequently. 62% said that is easy to use and 43% said that strongly disagrees with the complexity of the system. Sue's evaluation of the PC applications, 67% of the responders said that the system was easy to use. 59% of the respondents said that the system is well integrated and 50% strongly disagrees or agrees with the complexity of the system. The SUS evaluation of the whole system of the smart work, 65% of responders said that the system was very easy to use and 35% disagrees with the complexity of the system. In the interviews we conduct, with the pilot participants, we found that uh, of the three services, the one that had the best acceptance was LTME with the activity coach. We were told that the app was easy to understand. We can easily see simple metrics and we receive more regularly communications from Amelia. Many of the users said that they met the objectives of the exercises promoted by Amelia and other behind that said they drink more water. These are some of our lessons learned from the Smart Work Project. Technology and improvement of health and quality of life in future projects with this scope, it is necessary to carry out training or other actions to encourage users to improve their daily habits.
This could help them to achieve a more active and healthy life, thus improving their quality of life. The system is a tool and should not work alone. Digital literacy. It is necessary to consider digital literacy sessions with the participants that need it. Health literacy. It, is, it was noticed that most participants did not know how to interpret the data, despite having access to the dashboard or their laptops. The difficulty in interpreting these graphs prevented them from perceiving the importance of changing lifestyles or even daily habits. When the project ended, we recorded an interview with two of our colleagues, over 55, who participated in the pilot. There's their opinion. I could certainly recommend to others to go through an experience like this and then continue the experience. If, in the meantime, this program were to become official, I would like to work in a program like this. Other of our colleagues said, I think it will be a very good idea to put in the test in several companies, not only in mine, but in others, because it's a good for the workers, those who even have a few more years to work, because they will be more alert to tiredness, to nutrition and exercises. And I think it makes perfect sense to introduce it in our institutions or even in the companies. Thank you for your attention. If you have some questions, I'm happy to answer all of them. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the inspiring sharing. With the longest life expectancy in the world, Hong Kong should start looking at the meta and see how we can fully utilize our aging workforce. Uh, we shall now begin uh, with the question taken from the audience. Um, hello, Elizabeth. Hello. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, time and input. Um, we have some questions from the floor. Um, but first of all, I'm curious about when you uh, you have uh, introduced the work that you've done in Galadas and uh, how, how does it um, react from the uh, employment side? Uh, I'm sorry, I sorry. didn't understand how did, the question. Uh, how, how did the uh, employer or have you, uh, when you put into the uh, really in a work setting, how does the uh, 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 employer uh, taking this new uh, uh, approach? in uh, uh, this uh, so, uh, uh, as a new yeah. technology. Okay, uh, f uh, we had different uh, kinds of uh, perspectives, okay? Uh, some of them, they were really um, exciting to try to use something uh, different and just to see how it works. Uh, and we have another one that told me, oh, I'll just, uh, I, I, yes, I want to use that, but uh, I will see if I if I really want to to go through the experience uh, and and let's say so. But some some of them they really enjoyed that, uh, and other ones they were quite uh, afraid to use something different. Uh, and uh, this difference uh, is uh, quite um, connected uh, with uh, their own digital digital literacy. Mm. Uh, most most of our uh, uh, older uh, our colleagues uh, that had lower levels of digital literacy, they were quite more afraid to to go through the, the experience. Uh, but uh, most of them, they had they they liked and they enjoyed to to use that. Great. Um, I think that will be uh, taking lots more time for you to or your your organization to put into more to invite more employer or other work setting to use the technology. Um, one question from the um, uh, audience is: It is interesting that the smart work uh, integrate a range of self health monitoring and management uh, elements in a scheme. Why would you have that idea in the first place? Uh, let me just check the, the question. 
Oh, so uh, uh, they, uh, the audience are interested in why did you uh, put that idea into practice in the first place about the smart work uh, system? Uh, yes, the, the smart work system, is, it starts, uh, uh, it, it comes from uh, uh, EU uh, finance, from the, the EU, uh, e, the Union European. Uh, so actually, uh, we were invited from from other company uh, to make part of the um, of the, the project, uh, and uh, we analyzed it, and we thought that it would be really good to implement uh, this uh, in Caritas uh, Coimbra. So actually, uh, the main idea it wasn't from Caritas uh, Coimbra. Uh, we were invited. Uh, so, uh, yeah. I see. I um, great. So I, I think that invitation actually brought you to uh, a new step to your service as well. Uh, if, another question from the audience is, uh, are there any challenges for elder people to be engaged in using the app? And how, how would you uh, or your team to tackle that? Yes, uh, it, it's... Um, not for all of the uh, older adults, it's uh, difficult to engage them. Uh, although uh, at the beginning of the, the pilots, uh, we need to, uh, to be really uh, near them and training them uh, and also uh, help them, not, not just to use, but, but also uh, make them to, to understand the, the importance for, for them and for uh, their life. Uh, and uh, so in the beginning of the pilots, we are more near. And also uh, not just our work as, uh, as uh, project managers of the innovation department, but also the, the, um, the, uh, our carers uh, from the field. Uh, they, when uh, they believe in the project and they, uh, when they uh, see the benefits from from that, everything it works more smoothly. I see. Um, and uh, there's one question on the data that generated by the apps. And uh, are the are the data generated only accessed by individual user? Is there or any plan of uh, aggregate aggregate data and analysis behind the uh, project to yield findings collectively? Okay, the the uh, all the data at this moment it's just uh, inside the the projects uh, and for for us uh, our we as a user organization uh, we uh, just have some parts of the the data we don't collect them it, it's the the um, our um, technical partners that that do that. Uh, and uh, if you, we have uh, a plan, uh, no, at this moment, we, we don't have a, a plan for that. I see, I see. Um, there's one more question on the uh, participants inside the smart work service. So it was great to see the older persons to be, can be engaged through the smart work services. Uh, the audience would know that how was the working incentive of older persons in general, probably in Portugal or the area you serve? Okay, so uh, most of, most of uh, our um, uh, best um, results uh, were that uh, our colleagues, they, they were more aware of the, the importance to make exercise, the importance to uh, walk uh, during the periods, the, the break periods. Uh, to, so uh, they had changed little habits that, uh, that it would, uh, that uh, help them to improve the, the, their life. Uh, during the the period of the of the the pilot, uh, and uh, so I think I've uh, answered to the the question. Great, thank you. 
Um, I think, uh, thank, thank you for the sharing. Thank you, uh, uh, Elizabeth, for your input and also the team, I think the team effort has been uh, trying to foster uh, employment, no matter for, uh, for people who are in their old age and also probably uh, they are also engaging more employers or uh, the services as well into uh, this service. And um, thank you, Elizabeth, and uh, thank you very much. And we hope to meet you in person one day, in, uh, no matter in Hong Kong or Portugal. Yeah, okay, you're welcome to thank you. come here to Portugal and Caritas Coimbra. Thank you. Bye. Hello, everyone, and welcome, and thank you ever so much for inviting me to be here with you today. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about how technology can empower a more inclusive workplace. So uh, I'm Lucy Ruck. I'm the task force manager at a non-for-profit organisation called Business Disability Forum. So let me tell you a bit more about Business Disability Forum. So we're a not-for-profit membership organisation with over 30 years experience of supporting organisations around disability issues. And we support organisations to get disability inclusion right for its workforce and their customers and service users. We represent around 500 organisations that employ almost 15% of the UK workforce and around half of our membership have a global presence. So although we're based in the UK, we do look at things from a global perspective too. And around 60% of our staff have a disability or long-term condition, which also includes myself. So here's our mission statement, and we are Business Disability Forum, and we believe that 14.6 million people in the UK and over 1 billion people worldwide with disabilities and long-term conditions enhance the social and economic health of our societies. We exist to remove barriers in business structures and government that prevent disabled people from thriving and contributing in this way. But I'm here to talk to you a little bit more about the technology side of things, and, and I coordinate the Technology Task Force. And the Tech Task Force is about organisations working together to make technology accessible for everyone. I wanted to touch on why accessibility actually matters to business. And actually, there are many reasons why it matters to business um, and needs to be part of your business. So firstly, purely from an inclusion perspective, we know that at least 15% of the world's population has a disability. So this is actually considered to be quite a conservative figure. And we often hear more that one in five people have a disability in developed countries. We like to say disability is the biggest minority group in the world that anyone can join at any time. Um, and this is a huge number of people in itself. But when we also throw into the equation family members, loved ones, or those impacted, you start to realize the number of people that can be impacted is actually much higher than this figure. Um, and in fact, the total spending power of this community is estimated at 13 trillion US dollars worldwide. So if you think about it, what business wants to miss out on 13 trillion dollars? We know that companies that are intentional about disability inclusion are also more profitable, though up to four times, according to a report from Accenture. They are also more innovative and are viewed more positively by their customers and by their future talent. Historically, there have been many inventions specifically designed for people with disabilities that have become mainstream. So things like uh, captions or subtitles that we often now use, especially on social media, text messages, voice assistants like Alexa's or Google devices, um, and the typewriter um, that led to the keyboard that we all now use on our devices. And things like curb cuts and ramps, if you're looking for more physical examples, and even the bendy straw was developed for a father who wanted to help his daughter to become more independent when drinking. Your workforce needs to reflect the diverse markets that you operate in. So you need to employ disabled talent to ensure these people are included throughout the design process and product life cycle. Um, you, you, can, you cannot employ people and get the most out of these people if you're not accessible. And being an accessible employer means you need to take a proactive approach to making your products and services accessible, but also realizing that you will need to provide adjustments for individual circumstances. 
most adjustments more than repay the cost of implementing them. And according to Microlink, a UK provider of adjustments, the average cost of a managed adjustments process um, is less than £650. And if I've done my um, conversions right, this works out to about uh, £6,000 Hong Kong dollars per person, which might seem like quite a lot. But when you consider the cost against recruitment or the lack of productivity for these individuals, these are costs that are actually quite minimal. We did a, a piece of research called the Big Workplace Adjustments uh, Report a few years ago, and it states that 42% of respondents with adjustments in place had actually acquired their disability or condition while working for their current employer. So you aren't just talking about recruiting disabled talent, we're talking about retaining your existing talent from within your workforce. There are also compliance and legal reasons why this is important. The laws for disabled people are strengthening around the world. If what I described before was the carrot, so the incentive for getting this right, then this is definitely the stick, so the, the reason why we have to do it. So a company called DQ conducted some research that showed that costs can increase up to 100 times by not building accessibility into your design from the start. If you have to retrofit it, it's going to cost you a lot more. The more you do in the process and think about accessibility, the better chances of success you have. And by the way, if you think nobody is complaining is a signal that you're doing a great job, then think again. The click away pound research showed that 69% of disabled customers who struggled with their website simply went somewhere else. This could be a disabled customer or a talented disabled recruit you are losing or just our aging population. And I wanted to give you a small example of some of the talented disabled people we might be talking about. There's some pretty famous names for you. So the likes of Richard Branson, who um, is the head of Virgin, Steven Spielberg, the very famous director, um, Disney, I don't think I need an introduction to him, William Hewitt, Hewlett Packard, Henry Ford, the car designer, Steve Jobs from Apple. So don't look for the barriers, but see the opportunities. So all of those facts and figures I just gave you are included in our accessibility business case, uh, which we often call the ABC, along with links to those source materials. So you can use those um, internally. Now there's a really long link here, which I realize is not very accessible, but if you just type into a search engine, how accessibility benefits your business, then you should also be able to find these free resources. We also broke those five themes of the accessibility business case into five areas. So innovation, inclusion, brand, productivity and compliance. Um, and each of these has additional information and facts and figures that you can access. And you can tailor this to work for you. So if you think certain ones of these are going to land better in your organisation, please use those resources. The other piece of content that I'd highly recommend you go and have a look at is a really short video that summarises all this information. Um, and this is a really good example in itself of how to be accessible. So we made sure it had captions embedded within it and inclusive imagery. And there's also an extended audio described version for people who are unable to see the images as well. So please do have a look at that, which is also on the same web page. So how accessibility benefits your business and find those resources. I've got some stats for you. 83% um, of, of disabilities are required. Our research found slightly less, but actually we figure most places in the workplace, 83% of, oh, sorry, this is generally, I'm forgetting my own stats there. But yeah, of disability, most people aren't born with them. Most people acquire them. That was during working age, of course. And the average age of acquiring a disability is 53. So younger than you might think. This is always really interesting to me. So over 90% of disabilities aren't immediately visible. So you almost certainly employ more disabled people than you think you do. But I'm here to talk to you about tech as well. So this isn't just about additional tech or assistive tech, as we often call it. Google, Microsoft, Apple and many other companies are actually including um, accessibility within their product suite because they realise the benefit of this. So things like dictation is now existing in more applications. Um, how we use our phone, we often use that uh, a lot more. You can pinch zoom, of course, we all zoom in to look at stuff, whether it's pictures of family or text that might be too small um, on those touch screen devices. There are accessibility checkers now built into many of the applications that we use and larger fonts that you can set. I know I forgot my reading glasses the other day, so I made the font bigger 
to make it easier for me to read. Um, there's high contrast or dark contrast nodes with black, sorry, black backgrounds with white text on. These can be preferences, but they can also be accessibility requirements for those who really need it. Um, also things like uh, changing the color schemes and reading text aloud, you can now read back in a lot of mainstream text. Using captions are now essential for those who can't hear meetings or video content, but it also benefits others, including those who maybe it's not being transmitted in their first language, so they'd like to have some translation on there, um, or just seeing it in uh, the written, font, uh, written text can be really helpful. Or maybe if you're just in a noisy environment, or even if you just forgot your headphones, it can be incredibly useful, captions can. But I wanted to say having the tech in place isn't necessarily always going to solve all the problems. You're still reliant on people to check what they're doing. So even you go, well, I created it in Word and Word makes stuff accessible. It doesn't. It's the people inputting stuff into Word that makes it accessible. You still need to check it to make sure it does work. This isn't just an issue for those people with disabilities. It's about everyone who's creating content a quick check, is it accessible? How do I make it more accessible? And before you know it, you'll be just creating accessible documents or content that then works for any everyone um, and actually works better for everyone when we start to think about contrast. How often have I read a book to my children and the font in the print is not a good colour contrast to the background colour they've decided to use or they've overlaid it on an image? So if we all start to think about that stuff, it just works better for everyone. So the weakest link isn't necessarily the tech, it might be the people inputting. But sometimes the mainstream tech doesn't offer enough for what disabled colleagues um, or users may need. And this is where assistive tech comes in. So these types of tech that I'm going to talk you through are now commonplace with UK employers who realise the benefits of ensuring their disabled colleagues have the tools they need to do their jobs. So I don't know if you've ever heard text-to-speech um, software being used, but for a regular user of text-to-speech, um, you won't quite believe the speed at which they can listen to the written word. So in a study done by the Hertie Institute of Clinical Brain Research, an average sighted person can understand speech at six syllables per second. And in their study, they found some blind people can listen and comprehend speech at an astonishing 25 syllables per second. Information capture is about where you found stuff, audio images, links and so on, um, where you can easily then go to retrieve it. And this can be critical for some with cognitive differences. Speech to text is used for dictation. Um, speech recognition software can transcribe over 150 words per minute, while professional scram transcript typists can type around 50 to 80 words per minute. So you can see it is so much faster than even the most talented individuals who have really got those fast fingers. And lastly, but one of my favourites is mind mapping. Think of this as the digital version of sort of sticky notes on a wall whilst coming up with lots of ideas. Uh, this software allows users to capture ideas, expand on them in a digital format, export these into reports or PowerPoint slides or even charts and all formatted as they go. These tools can be also used collaboratively, which when we think about the digital world where people are working from multiple locations is absolutely essential. So how do we increase the adoption of these? Start with your IT department, make sure they understand why this is important. Um, make sure that they know it's needed and it's not just colleagues being awkward, which can often be the case. Apply a bit of positive peer pressure. Make it mainstream. See these as productivity tools that just work for everyone, but happen to be essential for those that really need it with disabilities. Um, so although I don't have a cognitive or motor related disability, um, and so I can easily use a keyboard and a mouse, I still use Dragon, a dictation software, to dictate notes as it's far quicker and more efficient uh, for me to capture that information really nice and quickly. Training is really important um, to ensure people are using this. So ensure that people know how to use the tools they've got 
and know who to go to for a bit more help sometimes. So if you've got super users or very high level users, make sure they are there to maybe give a little helping hand or a few pointers. And maybe even see if there's any e-learning where people can revisit the, the information we've learned. We all know we've been on a course and forgotten some really useful tips and tricks. So revisit that training as well. Reposition that adjustment and focus it on levelling the playing field. It's not something in addition, it's allowing people to do things in a different way to be them their best selves. So focus on the benefits to that individual rather than it being a problem. And also some of this is around the culture. Is there a stigma to having adjustments in place or having something a little bit different? If we think about it, the actually the most common form of assistive technology is the use of glasses or spectacles. We wouldn't not wear them if we needed them. This is the point we need to get to with additive technology. So we know what gets measured often gets done within organisations. So we've got an accessibility maturity model, which is a free tool which helps you assess where you are um, and help you figure out the things you might have not really thought as part of this accessibility journey, if you like. Um, and, and what you can do next. Um, so this is free uh, for anyone to download. There is a link on screen. I realise it's quite a long link. But again, if you go to a search engine and search a BDF AMM, -A -M -M, uh, then you will be able to find that. I'm just going to quickly tell you a bit about the maturity model. So it's about what does good look like? How do you know the things that need, need covering? Um, it's a self-assessment tool, so you can just download it. Um, and access it yourself. You don't need to show those scores to anyone, use it internally. It's developed by a range of organisations to work for everybody. So uh, government organisations have been involved in developing it, private organisations, banks, financial companies, uh, the retail sector and so on. So it really should work for most organisations and it is a free resource. So please do go and have a look. As I say, search BDFAMM on a search engine and hopefully you should find it. Also going to touch on another free resource, which is about training, um, knowing how to get buy in from colleagues, where to start with the training that you need um, can be a really important thing that we've discovered. So this is a free resource aimed at different levels of individuals, whether they be more technical, whether it's just standard users and knowing how to make a, a document accessible, how to do an accessibility check on your slides before you send it out to people. Um, this is available to you again. Uh, I could give you the long link, but I'd recommend you just go to a search engine and search for BDF Accessibility Training and you'll find this resource. So please do have a look at that. But I wanted to finish by saying it's more than just technology. So, of course, technology can be the solution, um, but it's actually about people. It's about you. It's about me. It's about our colleagues. It's about our children. It's about our parents. It's about everyone and it's about being included and it's about being human and being allowed to be part of this inclusive world that we want to create. So that's it from me. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can contact me here. Uh, there's my email address or on social media. Thank you very much for listening and thank you for inviting me along today. Thank you, Lucy, for your in-depth sharing. Well, she has uh, provided us with useful data on uh, useful idea on how to step by step improve the workforce accessibility. I'm really impressed by Lucy's passion on her work. It's just we can't uh, agree more with Lucy saying it is more than just technology. That's why we are all here today to put our minds together and find out how to to best use the technology for our service recipients. Now. We are taking questions from the audience. Lucy, thank you for your time and input today. No, my pleasure. And thank you ever so much for inviting me along to, to be with you. It's an absolute pleasure. Great. Um, we have some questions from the floor just now. And uh, the first question is, along with the uh, aging population, and I guess the population getting more diverse uh, no matter in, in different ways, uh, the need for universal design would go on to increase. Do you think the tech companies have observed the same, thus um, uh, more response from them in the recent years? 
Uh, yes, I think I think they they are. I think they're really realizing the benefit of being inclusive in in what they create. Um, so we work with uh, Microsoft and Google, uh, two obviously big tech companies, and they've got a real emphasis and a focus on making sure that what they do works for everybody, um, and that obviously includes people with disabilities. So you'll notice there's a lot more accessibility features just automatically built into the products these days, which is fantastic. I think what the big tech companies would also say is that you still need the smaller specialist sort of assistive tech companies. That's still really important um, because they will provide the more focused, the more detailed bits that people, only a smaller number of people would need. But what you do need to do is make sure that still works with the big tech because that's where some of the problems do come along. So yes, I think it's getting a lot better because they're thinking about it. If you're intentional about this stuff, um, then it happens um, and that's what they're doing. So yes. Great. Um, I think uh, you, you have mentioned some big names, of course. And uh, the other question is they, they, they're asking about any advice for smaller organizations which may not have rich resources to follow the model that you have proposed? So um, the, the maturity model, the accessibility maturity model that uh, we've linked to is free for anyone to download and use. So, so please do. As we often say, and is kind of common in so many things, what gets measured gets done. So measure it, look at, see what you're doing, look to see where the gaps are. This doesn't have to be necessarily about spending more money. Actually, what we find is if you start off thinking about accessibility at the beginning, it will save you costs um, later on by not having to retrofit stuff to, to your tech. So um, yes, I know it can be a challenge, uh, especially in smaller companies to kind of say why it's important. Again, I talked about we've got a business case um, uh, about how accessibility benefits your business. So please do go and have a look at that. There's some really good discussion points. Oh, have I frozen? Oh, oh no, it's fine. Oh, thank you. Is for, it okay? For, yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you for your answer. And I think what you have mentioned is very reasonable. For example, if you have uh, start to build a home or a building, uh, if you have first already thought about like accessibility, you may not to have more like uh, engineer or uh, or designer coming to check out the the, the buildings again or and and build another extra block of it and then uh, to facilitate yeah. people. I think that's exactly what you meant. Uh, one question yeah. about on the employers, you have mentioned the big names, of course, and um, how do you engage employers to have more incentive to adopt assistive uh, technology in workplace and so to benefit their uh, disabled employees? So we're really lucky because a lot of the companies that we tend to work with already get this stuff. So you don't have to have those conversations around why it's important. Mm. And actually, often they see firsthand. And I think there's nothing quite like sitting next to somebody who's struggling or something doesn't work for them to think, well, why wouldn't we provide it? You know, the cost of a lot of software is really minimal. When you think of salaries, other overheads you pay for, for colleagues anyway, you know, laptops, equipment, phones, and all sorts of stuff. A bit of extra software actually becomes very straightforward because it it's it, it evens up the playing field, if you like. It allows them to do the stuff they should be able to do, but it wasn't designed with them in mind. And that's not their fault, but it becomes their problem. So it's just about making sure that it's, it's even and fair for everyone. So assistive technology isn't an extra thing. It's just enabling them to do the job that they want to and need to do. I see. Great, and um, I think that will that that actually, uh, and, and, and especially when that community is getting bigger, um, they will be getting more easier. And they honestly, they have no more excuse not to use uh, the model or other help helping uh, 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 like uh, uh, assistive uh, technology in their workplace. Um, there is one question on, uh, so what do you think, what are the most common or needed assistance or corporate or uh, organization may need if they want to take the first step? Like, uh, what do you think uh, uh, they, they should do in the first step if they want to, uh, no matter, adopt the model or starting to think about like inclusive uh, workforce? I would say that the, the biggest challenge we often find is getting people to think about this stuff and understand why it's important. Um, I think it's 
obviously the tech is really important, but it's it's the focus around persuading colleagues why it's important. And often when people understand why, it's a much easier conversation to then get the technology in place. So I think actually, the tech actually generally isn't the problem, it's the people that can be the problem in terms of they provide the barrier and if you get the right technology in place that will remove those barriers, so working with that. But yeah, I think with a lot of things, it, it, tech isn't always straightforward, but getting colleagues to understand why and I think especially culturally in different countries that can be more of an issue and understanding that Disabled people are just people who happen to have been born or acquired a disability throughout their lives. And they're still skilled individuals that you want to work in your organization. You want diverse uh, individuals working for you who think differently about stuff and will bring something different and creative to your organization and, and bring a huge benefit to you. I think on top of what you have mentioned and also the, the question you just answered now, um, so what do you think the uh, success factors for the corporate or, or organization to adopt the model? Maybe you have just mentioned it's like about the culture or the management leadership. What do you think about like is, if there is one key factor of success, what, do, what, what, what would that be? I, I would say we often tend to find that within an organization, one person will get the conversation started. So there'll be someone who pushes this agenda within their organization. What I'd say is, turn this into your business as usual. Don't rely on that one passionate individual. Make sure there's multiple touch points throughout your organization. So when that talented individual has a passion for it leaves, you're still doing that stuff. And I think if that stuff is just built in to what you do, um, then, then you've kind of succeeded. I think the other thing is not to take your eye off the ball. So make sure that you continuously think about accessibility and inclusion in everything you do. Because tech, as we know, changes so so regularly. Every time I, I log on to Teams, I think that the, the screen looks slightly different. Tech moves all the time. And unless with everything we do, we are thinking about inclusion and accessibility, um, then the chances are, it will fall behind and then that's when we fall into problems. So turn it into business as usual, keep thinking about it. And multiple people, the more the merrier. Great, I think that you, you've mentioned about the culture and also uh, how actually one person or a small group of person can drive that uh, agenda or discussion inside a corporate. Um, honestly, uh, do you think, it, it, uh, how do you th uh, or, or you comment on uh, it? It will be. It, will it be become easy to become a token thing? You know, uh, to do something that is uh, quite on the surface. And how do you, how how do you think, or as your experience, how to avoid that? Yeah, it's a really good question because quite often you do find people just do it as a checkbox or, or tick, box, tick box exercise in terms of, yes, we, we employ disabled people, but they don't actually give them any purpose or any real job to do as such. And we, we do we do hear and, and see that sometimes. So I'd say actually utilize these people. You know, if you're paying them to do something, really support them to do do the job properly. Um, and you might be slightly surprised how good they are at it. And what we also tend to find is if you employ disabled people, they do tend to stay employed by you for longer. They have more loyalty um, and they still want to progress. They're, they're, they're just people. And I think we kind of need to get our heads around that a little bit, that they're not some alien race that have come down from Mars, you know. Um, they can contribute, they can make this world more interesting and um, we can learn from that. And what we often find as well is if you get things right for disabled people, it actually benefits everybody because you've probably streamlined a process, you've made it clearer, and then everyone else goes, oh yeah, I always found that really confusing or oh, on our website, I always found it really annoying that we had these pop-ups or different things happening. So again, it will improve it for everyone. I know that sounds like a bit of a cliche, but it genuinely is absolutely true. Great, thank you. I think you, you have mentioned a lot about actually it's a learning process. Um, it will take a long time, but we need to start the first step. So thank you, Lucy. Thank you for your time. And um, we would love to meet you in person one day, um, in, no matter in all the uh, meaningful course that you're doing. Um, so good luck and take care. Bye. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hey, 大家好
誒好高興，頭先都聽咗誒三位嘅講者，關於佢哋喺佢哋嘅國家啦，或者喺世界性，佢點樣去應用呢個資訊科技去幫助一啲長者同埋殘疾人士嘅就業。誒、呃，其實係好啟發性嘅。誒、呃，聽到葡萄牙嗰度啦，同埋英國，誒佢點樣推動，唔係淨係個理念，而係直情係誒好落地咁去做。誒、呃，特別聽到呢、這個、嗯、Microsoft 嗰個嘅做法咧，誒、呃、好 amazing 嘅，因為咧其實佢哋就唔單止係讓佢哋嘅科技係幫到殘疾人士就業，有佢向前好多步去行，或者提早好多步去行，係好 macro 咁樣將呢樣嘢咧去帶動俾唔同嘅國家咁樣。咁我見得到咧，其實誒佢哋都見到嗰個機遇啦，即係正如嗰個 topic 話齋啊，就 accessibility 究竟係一個誒誒誒誒誒誒責任啊，定係一個機遇咧？其實好明顯咧，佢哋睇到係機會嘅機遇嚟嘅。誒、呃、原來。提先，即係睇聽佢哋嗰個嘅啊講法，就係、是、原來一個共用嘅組織或者公司，佢個收益其實係可以好大嘅，係多出其他嘅啊廿八 percent 啊，又或者佢嘅總收入其實都可以好高啊，利潤都好高，其實係長遠係有咁好嘅就係 benefit 啦咁。咁而期間聽到就係、是、誒、呃，當一個共用嘅機構或者公司咧，其實吸引到人才。如果人才唔單止係講緊話殘疾人士啊，而係講緊咧誒，只要。一般嘅人才，而佢係有呢個咁嘅理念，有呢個價值觀，同僱主一樣係想誒、呃、有一個共融嘅誒誒社會，誒、呃、或者 diversity 嘅，其實吸引到人才，令到佢嗰個嘅需求咧係越滾越大，可以咧帶嚟嘅誒誒得益係更加大啦咁。咁呢個好欣賞嚇。咁、啊、誒、呃，另外佢哋嘅策略咧就係唔係自己做咯，係誒。呃 train 好多嘅國家，好多嘅大機構企業一齊合作，誒、呃、讓嗰啲企業去用佢產品之前呢，其實做咗好多功夫、啊、包括有一啲嘅誒誒誒誒策略啦，譬如話誒、嗯、比較人性化啲，我見到有一個係即係 enable enable a mentorship。program 嚇，另外一個就係 Microsoft Enabler Program 如果大家頭先有聽嘅，我見到咧就係話佢哋都會去 engage 一啲即係殘疾嘅朋友，頭先嗰個 Year Four 嘅讀 Data Science 嘅、呃呃、男仔咁樣、呃、而喺呢個 Microsoft 咧，佢可以好免費資助曬呢、這個、呃、即係學生、呃認識曬佢嘅產品，誒唔單止係嗰個嘅產品本身啦，誒、呃、仲有嗰個點樣用啊，啲技術啊等等一啲誒、呃、軟件啊咁，好讓呢一個嘅誒、呃、殘疾嘅學生去可以 well equip 到自己啦，而係去開展佢遲啲嘅誒企業，即係誒見佢臨尾嘅 sharing 都話啦，佢可以去一個 start up 嚇，好有信心咁樣。咁即係話喺嗰個 training 裏邊咧，都係由呢個 Microsoft 去嗯。去去預備提供，而係邊 employ 拜邊一個企業都好咧，佢能夠可以 well prepare 去到嗰間公司去誒，即、就、係、是、提供一個公開嘅市場啊咁。咁另一個咪比較人性化咧，就見到嗰位咧係誒，即係誒聽障嘅朋友啦。咁而 Microsoft 佢用呢個咧誒好人性化嘅方案，就係、是、誒用一個 mentorship program， 誒即係話呢位誒做 mentor 嘅誒聽障人士，其實自己都邊。empower 好有滿足感，誒、呃、覺得係誒好被尊重，因為佢能夠 mentor 一個咧誒、呃、殘疾即係、就是、有聽障嘅誒嘅員工咧喺個企業嗰度，因為其實佢 feel 到嗰個人個 ping 啊嘛 ，ping pong 就係、是、誒、呃、殘疾嘅或者一個叫聽障嘅啊朋友咧，其實佢最大困難係能誒即係點樣同一啲嘅。同事去誒溝通誒一啲叫做誒 able 嘅同事去溝通，佢最大嘅問題就係話誒點樣可以溝通得到呢？理解得到呢？咁誒、呃、而呢個 mentor 呢，佢可以透過一啲嘅科技啦，佢佢咗舉咗例子嘅，佢一啲叫做誒 speech to test 咁樣啊、呃，或者一啲好簡單嘅手語呢，去讓呢、這個嗯。able 嘅員工同埋一個聽障嘅員工咧，可以即係一齊相處到喺個工作間裏邊咧，係可以誒即係投入個工作。咁而成件事係好誒，即係有個共融嗰個嘅誒，即係價值啦，同埋都係誒，即係令到個誒聽障嘅員工咧都好有歸屬感啊咁。咁我好見得到呢個做法真係好。好好好誒，好有系統同埋好誒，好人性化嚇。咁我見得到其實 Microsoft 咧，佢就係透過即係 inclusive technology 喺誒工作裏邊，係讓殘疾人士或者一啲誒即係
，雖然佢冇特別去提倡啫，但係都係講殘疾人士咧，可以咧、呃、透過科技咧，可以係喺個公開市場或者一個誒唔、呃、同嘅企業嗰度咧，係、呃、工作。咁而、呃、Microsoft 佢都係、呃、用一個 partnership 嘅形式啦，呃、有 n p o 啦嚇 ，non-profit o r g a n i z a t i o n 佢自己本身啦，同埋咧就係、是呃、一啲唔同嘅合作伙伴咧，佢用一個 Jenny 嘅形式，由開頭嘅提高意識。即係所有嘅雇主、雇員、呃、去提高意識，就係、是、科技嗰個嘅、呃、重要性，點樣讓佢哋嗰啲嘅誒殘疾員工可以、呃、accessible、啊、另外就培訓人才啦。咁我見到佢都有提咧，就係、是、培訓咗誒好多嘅 hiring manager 啊，即係唔係就係培訓嗰個嘅科技本身，而係成個嘅、呃、理念啊，點樣去 inclusive 啊，同埋 accessibility。而進而呢，就可以提升嗰個就業能力啦。咁到最後提升完就業能力，都係講緊讓到成個誒、呃、business 可以即係有一個嘅裨益啊咁。咁咁呢個係一個誒即係好似一個。一個一條龍嘅一個服務咁樣啦咁另外誒到最後見到嗰、那個誒即係小朋友誒玩遊戲機咁，都係好 amazing 嘅。誒、这、呢個 inclusive technology 即係除咗講就業方面呢，其實佢哋嘅所有產品設計呢，都係講緊係要誒誒誒 accessible 嘅。就算一個殘疾小朋友佢打機咁樣誒。呃我哋見得到好開心啦，啲小朋友。誒、呃、誒、呃，有一句説話就係話，誒、呃、如果每個人都可以玩呢，就個個都贏啦。咁呢個都係好好好 touching 啦。嗯，打機啊，唔係你贏就我輸嘅啦。但係呢，原來一個科技可以令到大家都玩到呢，其實已經大家都贏咗嚇。咁、啊、亦都係帶動到一個共融嗰個嘅理念啦。咁、啊咁所以呢，其實誒呢個我比較 amazing 同埋即係比較 impress 呢，就係 Microsoft 嗰個嘅有系統地由佢哋出發。去誒將呢個科技咧融入喺呢、這個誒或者叫做誒讓殘疾人士咧去誒即係就業方面係可以更加 accessible 嚇。咁另外一個嘅誒即係分享咧就係啊啊 Elizabeth 嗰個啦，即係話係一個誒以僱員為本嘅人工智能系統嗰個誒佢所有嗰個嘅 pro 組成個 project 咧，佢好。佢好強調就係以人為本嚇，咁當中嘅 service 頭先大家聽嘅都見到有幾個層面啦，譬如有 office workers 嘅服務啊，誒 employers 方面啊，同埋 care 話，即係佢唔係就係針對嗰個工人本身，而係即係唔係就咁個用家本身，而係 employers 啦，同埋 employers。誒 employee 嘅誒誒 care 話啦咁，而另一個好欣賞嘅咧就係佢唔係就係淨係講用科技喺工作時間裏邊讓佢可以咁 productive， 而係話好多唔同嘅誒 apps 或者軟件啦，佢頭先有提嘅 Healthy Me 啊、誒 My Workability 等等咧，係可以 monitor 埋嗰個 user 即係個 employee 嗰個嘅身體狀況，係誒 more than 工作時間嘅情況，即係話其實睇得比較遠就係只要嗰個殘疾人士。佢嗰個健康好啲，佢個 image 好啲，或者佢成個 self care 好啲呢，好自然就係話佢嗰個工作嘅效能都會提高啦。咁所以佢嗰啲 apps 啊，或者嗰啲嘅手帶啊等等呢，其實係一個好好嘅即係 on the job monitor 住佢身體狀況，甚至乎係長時間了解佢個情況，而係俾到一啲嘅 wise 佢提點佢咁我見到呢個科技都係。誒，既係好人性化啦，亦都係好嘅關懷嗰個嘅元素喺裏邊嚇。咁而誒都見到佢嗰、那個誒誒誒，都會睇個效用啦，誒、呃、可用性啊，或者個影響力啊等等。誒、呃、講得好好嘅就係咧，其實一啲科技點樣可以幫到，或者係誒、呃、讓殘疾人士可以用得著，而係可以提到工作咧。其實最緊要就 usability。咁我見到佢嗰個 study 都去，即係都睇返嗰個誒好 positive 啦，即係好多人都會願意去用啦。誒、呃呃、最緊要就係嗰啲嘅產品，嗰啲 features 係 user friendly 啦。咁佢都誒、呃、即係 assess 過啊，其實都係誒好好好 positive 喎個 result、啊、另外個 impact 即係唔係淨係講緊工作上。誒、uh, productivity 高咗，而係講緊成個 workers 嘅 quality of life 啦。誒，佢整體嘅 health 係有提升啦，因為佢主要呢一個 project 都係針對啲較為年長啲，係五十五歲以上。咁誒、呃，如果係五十五歲以上，如果仲有殘疾嘅時候呢，其實我諗個 health 係好需要去留意，以至到喺佢投入返工作嗰度呢，都係會有個關係性喺度嘅咁。
。咁而誒帶出嗰個就係 training 啊 ，training 咧誒頭先 Microsoft 嗰度有講 training， 呢度有講 training， 甚至乎誒另一個誒即係講者都有提 training 好緊要。而家 training 咧誒好帶出就係、是。都有一句，唔系净系个产品本身嗰个科技嗰个 training， 而系成个 mindset 啦、呃。譬如头先提嘅 digital 嘅 literacy 吓，个素养、呃，甚至乎 health 嘅素养都要。如果嗰个人自己唔觉得 health 系重要嘅时候，咁你其实所做嘢都系诶冇意思啦。即系话其实用者 health literacy 要要 train 要要提升 ，digital 嘅 literacy 都要 train 都要提升。咁佢哋唔好對於科技有抗拒。誒、呃，正如頭先嗰啲嘅問答都聽到，誒、呃呃、好易嚟嘅嗰科技、呃、應用到。但如果、呃、用家係抗拒嘅時候呢，其實就誒冇、呃、意思㗎啦。咁所以我諗嗰個嘅誒，即係 digital l i t e r a c y 咧，都係一個好即係好需要、呃、去提升嘅一個部分啦。咁咁另外、呃、都都有分享返啦。嗰、呃那個嗯，關於 business。就是呢啲 forum， 我聽到佢最後咧話有個誒誒、嗯嗯、免費嘅 tools 咧，咁我聽完之後咧，我都覺得啊好好好喎，我哋即係香港嘅都可以試下，睇下會唔會誒上網去睇下呢個誒 tools 咧，去誒即係去檢視下自己公司或者自己機構咧，究竟 accessibility 嗰個情況係點樣？誒、呃、好見得到呢、這個誒呢一個嘅誒 UK 嘅呢一個誒、呃、NGO 咧嚇，佢哋。即係好 e f f o r t 期或者好倡議呢個咧啊誒 accessibility 啦，誒、呃、更加就係利用科技咧去製造一個誒即係共融嘅團隊啊。咁而頭先都好多誒、呃、即係分享咧，關於啲 technology 啊，誒、呃、即係頭先聽到話即係快到或者 technology 快到咧，即係打字或者誒怎即刻由文字轉為個語音係可以好快嘅。其實呢啲完完全全咧係好落地。係讓嗰個嘅殘疾人士咧，無論工作又好或者生活都好咧，係可以咧，即係誒同其他、呃、大眾咧，係可以即係共融啊咁咁而誒，剛頭先位講者都提誒、嗯、幾樣嘢啦，即係誒誒，憑、呃、背嗰個正面壓力都緊要嘅，即係話其實我哋誒講點樣應用科技喺嗰個嘅工作間、呃、要僱主又要 b u 誒僱員自己又都 b u 得嚟咧，其實同事都好緊要。誒、um, 有陣時我哋喺工作上或者我哋喺前線度接觸到呢，有啲誒、呃、殘疾嘅僱員呢，佢哋會誒翻嚟同我哋去分享就，就係話誒感覺被歧視啦，或者即係誒好似硬係誒做嘢慢啲啦，誒、呃、唔及人啦。咁其實其他同事點睇呢？咁咁所以我諗喺科技去讓佢哋可以融入到工作得嚟呢，其實會科技都要讓誒、呃、即係親家二非常時得嚟呢。其實我哋 training 俾。佢嘅同事都係一個好緊要嘅環節呢。咁。咁其實呢幾個 presentation 呢，我覺得好有誒啟發，而係誒誒好見得到即係唔同嘅地方都做緊好多嘢啦。咁咁翻翻嚟誒，如果講香港呢，誒就都都誒，即係都好多唔同嘅即係誒助協助殘疾人士就業嘅一啲嘅服務啊，誒無論政府啊、社署或者好多嘅 NGO 啊都有做啊咁。咁啊有，但有幾樣嘢見得到嘅。誒、呃、咁，始終香港都係一個誒，即係較為經濟型啲嘅社會咧。好多時都係講生產力啊，講嗰個經濟效益。誒、呃，就算僱用殘疾人士呢，可能嗰、那個、呃、大家個心態都係誒、嗯啊、社會責任啦。啊、呃呃、我請一兩位殘疾人士誒、呃、履行我嘅社會責任啦，咁樣。咁但係呢，誒、嗯呃、反而冇睇到呢，其實殘疾人士頭先。誒誒講者都有講，其實佢哋一個誒 talent pool 嚟嘅，即係人才嚟嘅。只不過可能我哋未去發掘，或者誒冇去透過一啲嘅 tools 讓佢哋嘅才華咧去衍生出嚟，甚至乎係喺個公開市場嗰度咧用得著。咁呢個係一個誒，即係喺香港嘅狀況咧，誒、呃、就比較偏向頭先講前者啲啦。咁咁第二咧就係、是、誒，因為香港太多中小企。誒唔及好似 Microsoft 咁，即係咁大嘅企業啦。咁如果咁多中小企業，僱主就算有咁嘅心，誒、呃、如果喺一個咁嘅經濟環境之下，亦都冇一啲誒誘因咧，讓佢哋去好積極、長遠去誒，即係誒聘請殘疾人士呢，其實誒係係難推動嘅。即係莫講話用科技先，即係令佢想去誒，即係叫做聘用殘疾人士嗰、那個。動機都唔係太大嘅時候咧，呢、这個係有即係都係啲問題啦。咁，因為我諗
。雖然頭先透過誒、呃，即係講者都有分享到，其實呢。呃如果聘用殘疾人士而係融入到嘅話，改善嗰個 accessibility 咧，嗰、那個誒經濟效益會好大嘅。我想講就係可能喺香港誒中小企嘅誒業、中小企業嘅誒誒僱主為即係為例啦，可能佢哋都未見得到將來可能帶嚟嘅誒效益嘅支持呢。淨係見到短期要付出嘅成本去做一啲嘅 accommodation 啊咁，咁所以呢個咧係一個即係、就是、缺乏有因嘅情況之下，亦都冇個長遠嘅、呃就是、支援之下咧，而一個誒無可否定嘅一個誒誒擔心嚟嘅咁、呃、另外就喺香港都即係、就是、政府都係推好多誒誒即係新科技啊、諸如此類啊咁，咁多啲就喺日常生活上嘅應用啦，呃但係如果話即係推動資訊，誒、呃、推動呢個新科技喺就業上呢，就誒、呃呃、可能都有嘅，不過就唔似話即係好好好好好普遍啦咁咁誒反而講真呢，誒講科技之前一啲好基本嘅嘢，譬如係誒即啲設施啊加、呃、通道啊等等嗰啲嘅誒，即係香港地方比較細啊嘛，令呢啲嘅場所嘅設備咧都,都未作得好嘅改善咯。咁其實呢個叫逐步做暴利嚇。咁、啊、另外第四就是、都係嗰句，香港就可能相對都欠缺長遠嘅策略啦。呃、其實。誒有嘅，政府有多嘅唔同嘅誒誒輔助就業啊，或者殘疾人士嘅誒在在職培訓計劃等。另外都有個叫殘疾僱員嘅支援計劃，咁就係即係添置一一次性咁添置一啲嘅嘅誒儀器或者裝備，去俾嗰啲殘疾人士嘅工作。但係一次性咯，就唔得長遠啦。另外有一個都接近頭先嗰個 mentorship 嘅，就有個指導員嘅獎勵金嘅計劃。不過誒嗰個金額或者嗰個嘅誒時間性咧，亦都係誒唔得。sustainable 嚇，咁呢個就有少少就係、是、誒做咗少少，但又唔係太足夠咁。咁所以整體嚟講，我覺得香港誒、呃，如果話即係誒應用誒科技喺呢個誒殘疾人士就業裏邊咧，其實幾樣嘢都要諗嘅，就即係真係個長遠成個誒，即係政府係咪能夠牽頭去引入或者去促進咧，用科技喺嗰、那個誒。呃誒就業市場度，讓殘疾人士可以即係 inclusive 咁一齊工作啦咁。而第二呢，就係都喺企業嗰度啦，即係誒會唔會政府可以即係透過一啲嘅補貼啊、誒誒減税啊等等呢，嚟到鼓勵呢啲企業呢，可以即係誒聘用殘疾人士啦。不過當然帶出係用即係科技嘅一啲嘅方案呢去做啦咁。而到最後呢，頭先都講咗培訓，培訓係關於誒僱主、僱員、公眾、僱員自己同埋誒。那個培訓唔係就係講技術，而係講緊成個 mindset， 長遠個支援係點樣咁所以其實誒嚟、呃、到呢度呢，其實無障礙去到共融呢、呃，科技其實係一個手法，係一個工具。呃、而最重要就係要有個決心啦，同埋策略啦。咁好讓呢個科技呢，可以幫得到殘疾人士就業上呢，係成功，同埋可以有持續性囉。咁、啊、呢個都係少少分享咁啊！多謝大家。